aim of today, well, because we are a bit in a time squeeze, I really have to s speed this up. Um, what do we want to learn from this session? What do you want to learn from high-dose chemotherapy? It works, yes or no? Or any ideas? Okay. You want to know if it doesn't work? Okay, so we're gonna go into that, that, well, okay. So I believe that actual science and actual data will help us to know if it works, yes or no. So I prepared um, first to, to let us think, what is high dose therapy? How does it work? Why is it thought to be effective? What has been studied in neuroblastoma? How to proceed in neuroblastoma? So, if you look in the literature, and I didn't put in normal, in a normal dose, so we have the high dose, the mega dose, the low dose, and the dose dense. So what actually is high dose chemotherapy? What does it mean? How do we define high dose? And mega dose is, is the same as high dose, so that's an easy one. Yeah. Okay, so high dose is that the dose is so high that you have an organ failure, like the bone marrow, and you need stem cell rescue to, to be able to, to help the, the toxicity. Yeah. And what's then low dose chemotherapy? Not entirely myeloblative. Not entirely myeloblative? Okay. Well, okay, the low dose is more than like the metronomic, the, the, the chemo that you can give on without having to wait to, for the organs to, to uh, uh, be, be become normal again. So normal dose would be indeed not myeloablative, but then you have organ dysfunction and you have to wait till the organs are functioning again, like the bone marrow depression, like every 21 weeks you can give a chemo because it's... Um, you have the bone marrow depression, and, and uh, the low dose will... Most of them are, yeah, most of them are in that, in that range. By yeah, by definition, yeah. And those dense, what's then those dense? Adapted to response. Adapted to response. Yeah. Auto to toxicity. So, I think it's, just not it's not, well, I. So I, okay. I think rapid kojic is dose dense. And in the hepatoblastoma, the chemo is also dose dense. That means that you go on with the chemo, despite the fact that the, uh, the, the, the chemo side effects have not been reduced. So you still are in aplasia, but you still go on with the cisplatinum. Um, so you don't wait till the, for the body to recover, but you do go on with the chemo. So the, 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 the chemo is in a more fast way given. The, the dose is denser. So that's actually what, well, what we mean by dose dense. So can all drugs be given as high dose chemotherapy? And what's efficacy and toxicity? And why can some drugs be used for high dose, yes or no? So you, sh you say no, why not? Okay, so actually it is a bit, even a bit more, well, to the, to the pharmacokinetic side. So some drugs have a linear dose relationship, a dose relation effect. So you can see that if I would increase the dose here, yeah, we see my mouse, the effect still goes up. So this is a drug that the more I give, the more effective it will be against the cancer. 
So this is a it's a drug where it's a parabolic. So if I go, my dose goes up, I'm I'm still at effect here. So if my dose goes up to here, it it will not increase the effect effect. So we need a drug with a linear dose relationship, and then we are in uh, I'm uh, your page. So then we have the toxicity. So in the yellow line is the toxicity. So here, if I would increase my dose then the toxicity would be rate limiting for the normal organs. I mean, if I would go higher, it would be still effective for my tumor, but my normal organs will not um, benefit. And for here, well, the toxicity is here already, so if I would increase the dose a bit, there would be a bit more effect, but, but the, the toxicity will not allow it. So years ago, when they first started to study this in, in solid tumors, they looked what was the dose limiting toxicity, and they identified the agents where the, there was myelin suppression as dose limiting toxicity, and there, if there was a linear um, um, uh, um, uh, efficacy, then they said if we will give those um, patients stem cell rescue, we might overcome the toxicity. So what they think, if this is the dose limiting toxicity, and we will increase the dose, so with the stem cell rescue, we can increase actual the toxicity. Um, so we can go up in these patients with the chemotherapy. But then, so the efficacy will be better, but then there is also oral other organ toxicity. So with those drugs, we can increase the dose. But then again, we have to look at the other organs. So we have to identify drugs that have a linear dose relationship. Dose limiting toxicity is the, the, the bone marrow. And then have to, we have to look if we increase the dose, what will the other organs be? So there are not, so that's why we have a limited um, number of drugs that fulfill these criteria. So this is uh, something I think we really need to also understand. Yeah, so the, the graph of my parabolic phase should have been lower um, because we are already at the upper limit. So if to increase it, you, you will not get um, more efficacy. Yeah. Okay. So there should be efficacy also in the tumor. And what we know now, if we treat patients with neuroblastoma with immune therapy, we have isolated central nerve system relapse. So why is this? Why do we see this much more than we used to see this? Why is the tumor recurring in the brain after immune therapy? Okay, immune therapy doesn't cause a blood brain barrier. Yes, that's correct. So that's why we don't treat those patients, those lesions. But previously, when we didn't give immune therapy, why did we not see those lesions anyway? Yeah, so this means actually that immune therapy does something with the metastatic lesions that are still in the body, and because these are being treated, these, these don't relapse. And that's why the, the, the parts where the immune therapy doesn't work can relapse. So we learn from this that immune therapy is doing something, and that does, those patients would have relapsed before on other sites. And then the, this one has had, had, had the time to grow, and it would already die from lesions, metastatic bone marrow lesions, because these are in 75% the, the reason why the tumor recurs. So we learned two things, that we need to, to um, something to, that penetrates in the brain, and that, or, uh, or antibodies also for in the brain, but also that the anti immune therapy is also really doing something here. I strongly believe that if we really want to know if something is working, we have to do randomized control trials. Although they have taken a long time, um, if we really want to find out something is doing, it should not be the doctor's decision which patient will have which treatment. Because I'm a doctor, and I don't like high dose. And if I have a patient who I think is doing right and, and might survive, and I might not give this patient a high dose. And the patient, I think, oh, is not doing very well. And really, we need to, to, to throw everything what we have at it. Then I would give that patient a high dose. So 
we should not be the ones making the decisions how to treat and not to treat. So we looked at the Cochrane Review, and this was sent also, or this was in, in one of the collections. Cochrane Reviews are the highest level of evidence of what's out there. So I, I worked in some Cochrane Reviews, and it's, it's very, very high standard, but it's also very hard to do so because it's a lot of work. So what they do is they look, so in this case, they look at randomized controlled trials, and they go to the actual studies, and they go to the actual data, and they also write to the authors who really have the data, and they do everything themselves. So they go back to the raw data and do the statistics themselves. So if the study says, well, EFS was 50%, and they think it's 45%, they will calculate it to 45%. So they really go back to the data and analyze this themselves. So this Cochrane review is also being updated in time because if studies evolve, the outcome data can change over time and they take along the newest uh, data. So they looked at event-free and overall survival and only randomized controlled trials and they identified three papers. Uh, the Pritchard paper, um, the Mate paper and the Beltort paper. The Mate paper randomized high dose versus conventional chemo and um, retinoic acid, yes or no. And this is a very old paper with already old chemotherapy. Um, and also the updates from that paper showed that there was an, indeed a an, an significant still relationship with event-free, but not anymore overall survival. The um, Bertolt paper has published an update recently, but it was not included in this paper. And well, I sh I'll show the back paper and the Pritchard paper um, they took along. So they say that after all the updates, there is still an, uh, a significant effect on event-free survival. However, if you look at the updated version, there is no, and I think this is the, the one, no um, uh, significant correlation anymore with overall survival. So um, the patients um, have fewer events but die in, in the end. So this is something I think is still hard to, to understand because we think first you have an event and then you die, um, but this is what it is. Then the German people published an update on their study. So what they did, say they, um, so they had different, different arms, and this is the arm where they treated with N5 and 6 courses, which is now the randomization also in the Siopen uh, study. And then they uh, randomized between the stem cell transplantation uh, with high-dose chemotherapy, they did the MEC, so the uh, melphalan etoposide, um, 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 oh no, the... Um, uh, carboplatinum, yeah, yeah, uh, versus N7 courses. And N7 courses are the, in, in the non-high risk treatment, they have this, and this is cyclophosphamide, basically. Um, and then they said immune therapy really does something for those patients, and in that era, they had anti-GD2 antibody treatment. So they did the update for the patients with the immune therapy to be able to really compare uh, to the standard of uh, treatment of now. And this, the German group always do their studies very, very nice and thoroughly. So they have an intention to treat analysis, which is basically every patient that comes in the door and is entered the study, they take along. So even if the patient the next day dies because he falls off the stairs, it's taken along because it was in the study. So they do not select uh, the patients, they take everything along. So you have the first curve is... Uh, uh, how they were um, uh, in the study, then it's, it's as treated, and this is as treated as randomized, and what we see is with the update, both event-free and overall survival still are significantly in favor of the high-dose treatment with patients with the antibody, so without cytokines. So I think this is, although there, this, there are small patient numbers in there, this means in my opinion, high-dose chemotherapy does something for a group of high-risk high, uh, high patients. So we have three randomized controlled trials, long-term efficacy. The Cochrane says, yes, significantly EFS, no OS, but they did not take the last um, version of the Bertolt paper into account. So I'm hoping they will do another update, and then we will know if the OS for all the studies will be significant, yes or no. So from this, the world said, okay, high-dose chemotherapy works. We need to know then which chemotherapy, yes or no. Um, and then 
the, uh, the European study tested the BUMEL versus the, the MEC, uh, and the COG said, okay, in brain tumors, double transplant, triple transplant does something, is it also something for neuroblastoma? Because we have very intense treatment, and 60% of the patients relapse and die. So we really do need to do something better. So this is the, uh, the um, European study where they have the rapid cojack. Then uh, if you're not in complete remission yet, you can do the TDVD. And then the randomization, BUMEL versus carbo melphalan. So they call it SEM, the Germans call it MEC, but it's apparently the same. And then the radiotherapy and the immune therapy. And in that area, there were patients with and without the immune therapy, so it's, it's a longer study. So what they show clearly is that the event-free survival is better and the overall survival is better for the patients with the BUMEL. So apparently the, the rapid cojack contains no doxorubicin, and in those patients, the, the, these patients can be rescued by BUMEL, uh, and then uh, it, it, it is better, uh, it, it gives a better event-free and overall survival. Is there a difference if you, if you have done yeah, well, yeah, the TVD uh, question is, well, TVD is going to be reintroduced in the new protocol. Um, there are uh, two papers, I'm not sure if they're already published, if TVD does something. So one study shows that if you um, nor are not in complete remission, TVD, in 20% of TVD does something, so you need to treat 100 patients with TVD in order to have 20% efficacy. Um, and the other study says it, it only prolongs the chemo, so don't do it and go do something else. So the truth is still out there, um, but I think um, it does something, but you need not in everybody, not all, uh, every patient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, oh yeah, so the toxicity was quite uh, a lot, so there is... Um, pulmonary toxicity, there's VOD, but there is uh, also the mucositis and the patients go to intensive care because of the infections. So it's, it's, it's not for free. It's, it's a burden for the, for the patients, for the parents. Um, so that, this is also, I think, why the people say, well, should we still co continue to do so? The COG study had um, the cyclo-based, uh, um, cyclophosphamide-topo-based two cycles of induction, and then the vertical chemotherapy, and then the randomization single transplant carbo atoposite melphalan versus double, in which they have thiotipa in there. Thiotipa penetrates very good the blood-brain barrier <clears throat> and might eradicate CNS disease. So this might be the answer to our CNS recurrences after the immune therapy. <clears throat> this is a study that has run a long time. And if you look at the general cohort, the EFS is significant, but not the OS. And if they then focus on the patients who have had the immune therapy, so the lower bar, there it correlates with better outcome, the tandem versus single. And even the, the, uh, the five years EFS and OS are, are quite nice. So they show that double transplant is better than single transplant. So the discussion is going, are we going to lose it? And the, the, the studies are going for more. Yeah, so this is a very interesting question. So with this in mind, the, the European high-risk study now said, okay, we, we need to know also what's, what's the, the truth here. So they have the BUMEL and then the, the single and the double transplant uh, in there as well. For the patients with a cyopen of more than three, you, you can either, well, give the TVD or you can have them go to the, uh, the Veritas. And the Veritas has two times MRBG uh, in there, uh, followed by the BUMEL or the double transplant. Because the patients who have a poor outcome with a cyopen of more than three, we, we think we need to do something other, better, because just giving BUMEL will not... Uh, rescue most of them. So the question is, they have MIBG hotspot because it's a cyclin of more than three. So is MIBG therapy there the answer or the double transplant? So this is something we will learn in the end. In the COG, they also want to know, uh, and this is not high dose uh, treatment, but this is MIBG related. So in COG, they say, okay, should we give MIBG 
to the patients which um, have MIBG positive disease. So there they start with the, the sopo, topo sci chemo, they do the harvest and another course, and then the, um, there's a randomization, uh, MIBG, yes or no, uh, and thereafter a randomization, which high-dose chemotherapy. So we will learn from this study, uh, MIBG up front, is it doing something, and um, which chemotherapy with the different background might be helping. Because in their earlier studies, not randomized, the, the MEC arm did better than the BUMEL arm. Uh, but there were reasons why patients were treated with BUMEL and not MEC, possibly toxicity. So we, we really need to learn this. Yes. The stem cells harvest, yes, yeah, so they will harvest stem cells anyway, because they're scared to do it after MIBG. The harvest might not be as, as good as before that, so they will harvest anyway. Yeah, yeah. So then we have this uh, publication and then the discussion uh, to, um, to, to transplant or not to transplant. And I... Um, I challenge you and I advise you to read the paper carefully uh, to really make up your mind what you think uh, is in there. So what they describe is that, um, and, and I think the New York group has done a lot of things really revolutionary, so they really helped us think and bring things to the clinic and do things differently. But what they say here is that um, they started to do the high-dose chemotherapy uh, in the earlier days, and there, there, then there were two studies um, from Spain, and I forgot what the other one was, where they said there was no survival advantage, and then they stopped doing the high dose. They had a lot of toxicity, a lot of mortality, uh, and the studies that they refer to are not randomized controlled trials, but just cohort studies in which they show that in that era, um, there was no improvement. And then they are a referral center for the um, 3FH um, uh, immune therapy. So they have uh, a cohort of patients from their own in which they have no high-dose chemotherapy. And there are a lot of patients that come there which are referred or come there on their own because of the immune therapy. So we don't know, uh, and that have had high dose, so we don't know who those patients are, what have been treated before, and why they come to uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering to have the immune therapy there and not stay in their own center. Um, and they say, okay, we have a lot of patients between 2003 and 2013, and from these we have so many patients um, that uh, 160 were treated with the high dose, and so we, we can do statistics on this. And they have a table in there with the patient population, but actually what we don't know is at start of the immune therapy, what was the remission status? We have the MRD, so in the bone marrow messenger RNA, but we don't have remission status. And they say that the patients who um, started with a high dose have a significantly longer um, time from first chemo till the naxitimab, till the 3 of 8. Um, there are more ultra high risk patients in there um, and um, more patients who have had second line treatment to achieve VG CR, VGPR before the study entrance. Um, so that's what we say in, 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 the, in, the, um, uh, in the text and in the table, we cannot find this back. Um, and then the patients who have had ASCT had had different regimens. So they had SEM, they had single or tandem, but also different drugs. Um, so it's really a mixed bag of patients with the high dose that have been treated. So with those data, they say the group with high dose is not doing better than the, the, the patients who had had the, their maintenance, their, their standard treatment. And I think statistically, this is not the way to do this. I mean, you're really looking at apples and pears and grapes and oranges, because. Um, I think patients who do not achieve the CR, VGP are very good after high dose or have extra treatments needed to achieve this and have the high dose, they want to go for other treatments. So we are not sure what kind of population has been included in this because we don't know what are they. So if you really want to know if it works better than what they do, 
the better standard treatment is you have to randomize it. You cannot just, just lump it like this because there are tertiary centers and they get the patients who are desperate because um, sometimes the centers say, okay, there's no curation options for you here. We cannot make you better. And then you can have in a, in a tertiary referral center, they say, okay, well, we'll give you the antibody. So those patients are in there. I know because we have had those patients who went there. So those patients are in there. So we really are looking at different groups. So this is not, I think, the way we should do our analysis and our statistics. So the patient's advocates say, okay, it's toxic. It's, it's, but there are long-term sequelae. It's not good for, for us. And we are not curing more patients. So, and actually, I, don't I'm not, I do not agree that we don't cure more patients. Um, but I agree with them. We should also look at alternatives and other things. But I don't think we are we dare to stop doing the high dose because I think we will go back in our, our, our outcome data. So this is what in the paper. This is our, the literature that they reviewed. Um, and I agree that there are lots of open questions. One size does not fit all. High-risk neuroblastoma is not one group. There's different populations in there. There are patients with localized disease with MIC amplification. Do they need that intensive treatment? Are there subgroups that we can use, that can we treat with um, um, uh, targeted therapies? And do they also need the high dose? I don't know, but I think we need to find out together. Um, there's a group with chronic neuroblastoma. Um, well, I think we also need to look at those patients because we have had a referral of a patient with a chronic neuroblastoma who has been, well, they said you're incurable and they, I think the boy was already being on his fourth year of timazolamide and then he came to our center. We did an MRI with the DWI and we said, oh, it's all ganglion aroma and we biopsied and we, we proved, we demonstrated it was true. So how many patients that are being cured out there um, with other things are actually the ganglion aromas that, that we should not give the high dose or other treatments at all. So I think we don't know this yet, so we have to do this together. So I think with that, um, I, um, I also um, encourage you to read the paper on the long-term outcome because the toxicities are quite severe. We heard also yesterday but sometimes I think there's also genetics involved in there, that sometimes patients have genetic aberrations why they don't grow as much as others. So it's not only the treatment, um, but the treatment component is obviously there. I mean, we have our outdoor patient, and I see those patients weekly, the long-term, well, I'm, I call them survivors, but the long-term, uh, well. And, and sometimes it's, it's, it's horrible what we, what we do. So this is cumulative um, events on the hearing loss, um, which is cis pattern induced, so not high dose, but cis pattern induced already. Uh, second neoplasm, but we still don't know how many have a P53 aberration. So are all the secondary neoplasms because of the chemo or because they have a tumor predisposition syndrome, which we don't know yet because we don't test it. Um, the cardiac events, they are there. Renal events, yeah, we, we sometimes we treat, and, uh, we, 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 we take or, or we, we destroy the kidney at surgery. The chemo is not good for the kidneys. Um, the focal or nodular hyperplasia, yeah, I think it's not an issue because if you can really see on MRI what it is, then we can really assure the patients. And the thyroid events for neuroblastoma are, are, are really sky high and not even in the patients who have had MIBG treatment, but also in non-MIBG treated patients. So there also, is it MIBG or is it genetic predisposition? We don't know yet. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. So we didn't sign up, and also we try to really build our own database with the long-term survivors, so that we can we can learn. Yeah. Yeah. So how to proceed towards the future? I don't know. I don't have the answers. I only urge you to quickly read what's out there, and read between the lines, and really, I. If I really read a paper, I always go to supplementary data because I always want to dig in there. I always want to, I just don't look at the graphs. I always really want to have the data. And, and if you scrutinize the data, then you know, because you, you can say the glass is half full or half empty, or you can say, ah, but actually there is no glass there. 
Um, so there's a study on, on, on liquid biopsies in brain tumors, and they in kids, and they said, well, it's working in 25%. And then I really looked what samples have been taken, what time points, diagnosis, during therapy, during... And actually, there's not a single word in the paper or in the supplementaries stating what samples have been taken, when and where. So if we don't even know if the sample has been like a week on the bench, and they say, oh, it's rubbish, or if it had been taken when the patient was in complete remission. I mean, those data are crucial. So you need to know this before you can interpret the data. So with that, I, uh, I rest my case. Yeah. So I would, s well, yeah, let, let's, for the discussion's sake, it's a MIC amplified tumor. I would go on with treatment. Because I think, um, yeah, so you can, you can do the two TVDs to see if it, if it will shrink. But mostly the aorta is encased 360 degrees. If it shrinks, it will still be encased. So um, then I would really go on with the high dose chemotherapy. And our surgeons, well, we will dis debate with them. Um, but if you would try to do that, you will waste a lot of time. And if it's a MIG amplified, within three weeks, it can really regrow, uh, recur. So then I would go for the high dose. Uh, and afterwards, if it still would be inoperable, I would ask a radiotherapist uh, to, to, to look at it and, and to re do radiotherapy. Yeah. So I would go on. Well, I think that that evidence is not really... No, yeah, okay. But anyway, I, well, I, I, we, yeah, we have patients who haven't had a reception and then we get a local progression and it, you feel logically at least that the reception yeah. of tumour is beneficial. But I think it's difficult to get, stand, it's difficult to get that standardised and different surgeons have different thresholds. That's what we struggle with. And so our surgeons quite hands-off. They don't want to recept, whereas we've had to send patients to other centres in the UK who are willing to do a primary you know, reception. Yeah, so we have had, of course, in our center, in our country, we are really hands-off. Uh, we are do no harm. Uh, and our surgeons really think that surgery will not make the difference. And we are currently performing a an, 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 an review of our data. And, uh, well, I think it's very low numbers that really have a local recurrence uh, after treatment. Uh, and especially with the radiotherapy being, being done, um, it, it's not, but we, we do know there is a lot of, of evidence already out there that's a lot of toxicity after aggressive surgery. So I think, as always, the truth is in the middle there. Um, um, so the surgeons, most of the surgeons say, okay, because it's, it's, it's such a disparse disease. I mean, it's not a renal tumor. You can take it out, and then it's, it's, it's locally cleared of disease. You always leave, leave remnants. If you look at MRI or imaging post-surgery and, and what the surgical report is and, and the imaging, if you do it co correctly, I think there's a 50% discrepancy there. Um, so that that's already means that well, surgery might be important, but the local, the, the, the systemic treatment is even more important. And especially if we will irradiate all those kids and have the randomization if there's still residual disease and we give more radiotherapy there, and that will help, I think. So, I, so they, they have the randomization, yeah, uh, 21 gray versus the, the 36, because we actually, if you look at the evidence to irradiate the primary tumor, it's not being studied. We just do it and we think we cannot go back because the, the outcome is still not good. So reducing treatment is not an option. So when we wrote the HR2 protocol, we have had this debate. Should we or should we not irradiate? Because it has never been proven in a standardized manner. But we thought we cannot go back. So then we had oh, said, okay, we have the, the discussion. Uh, if there's remnant disease, do, should, should we need a higher dose, yes or no? 
And this is not even including the discussion on the metastatic lesions. Because we did a survey, and officially we do not irradiate in Siopen metastatic lesions. We did a survey, and then the centers who responded anonymously, 50% did radiotherapy on the metastatic lesions. So we think we need to do this together and also, yeah, or study it or have a consensus on it. So there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah, so in the new, the high-risk uh, update with the, the uh, lorlatinib arm, I think it's TVD, because I haven't seen it yet, but there is going to be, again, sort of a rescue chemo. I think it's TVD or, or something TVD-like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, maximal, yeah, 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 yeah. Because now all the patients go to Veritas, yeah. and Veritas, so there's not a lot of MRBG treatment uh, available. So all those patients now drop out. Yeah. Um, so do you, for example, say for the patients to Veritas? Yeah. Do you discuss that? Yeah, we, we can do. Yeah, we can accept patients for Veritas. Yeah. Yeah. I have very low experience with, with like MRBG treatment. What are you seeing as side effects? Or, I mean, it's like wonderful. Yeah, so I come from, um, so when I was a student, I, I worked at the uh, Antonio van Leeuwen Ziekenhuis, the, the, and there we did the first MABG therapy. So when I was a student, I already, already was involved there. So in the AMC, I think we have treated like 130 patients with MABG, and actually, it is very good. They're, so, so they can have the silo adenitis, so they can have the, the parot parotis that's irritated. Uh, sometimes they're a bit nauseous, they want, don't want to eat. Um, and we have to give the, the, the thyroid protection and the radio. So the, I think the most important is that the nuclear imaging um, distancing and, and um, so the life, life um, uh, advices because of the radiation. That's the most annoying. Um, but I see, well, what we saw is that the kids, we, we, so what we did, we did it up front, the high-risk patients, we started with two times MIBG and then chemo. Um, so the patients, we could put reduced painkillers. They started to eat and gain weight themselves because they felt better. Um, so we saw only positive things. Unfortunately, there was one stage 4S infant, which was four weeks old, being treated with MIBG. And then, because it's, it's in a room and it's lying there, and we, it, we don't have the monitoring. And then we saw, oh, but she, she, she really needs... Uh, feeding and then she had respiratory depression and we we brought her to the intensive care unit but she died so she had a massive growth of her mic amplified liver and respiratory failure of because of that because we couldn't monitor her very well so then we thought oh this is very bad so we really need to monitor closely which patient can go in and, and everybody was scared that we didn't do, dare to put any patient in there and then we we started doing it again so actually if the patient especially the older patients, it, it, is, it is okay, it's really good. 